the subject of spiritual warfare was very uh, common in Puritan times and certainly, I'm sure, in the history of this uh, country as well. Think of the Covenanters and there was real conflict, uh, but that was only uh, a reflection of the greater spiritual conflict uh, that exists. And we do want to begin this evening with the right focus. We don't concentrate on the enemy, first of all. Yes, the enemy must be considered. But first and foremost, we, we focus on, uh, as Hebrews tells us, the captain of our salvation. The one who leads us and the one who makes us more than conquerors. The one who has already brought us and led us and given us that triumph that we rejoice in, the victory that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. The first passage that was read is a very well-known passage, and it's even as a, a young a person, a non-believer, I was familiar uh, with this story, with the, uh, the walls of Jericho uh, collapsing. And we read the whole chapter, but we're not going to actually look at that chapter. We're going to look initially at the first or the, the last three verses of the previous chapter and then move over to Colossians. And we want to, first of all, establish the principle of what I'm suggesting to you is the need for us all to have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, a real encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ before we can even begin in this warfare. Look at the last three verses of uh, Joshua chapter 5. Let me just read those three verses uh, to you. And it came to pass when Joshua was by, was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Let me just present before you uh, some simple principles from what we've read. Notice, first of all, where Joshua was. It says he was by Jericho that we read at the end of the next chapter, chapter 6, was the place of the curse. It was under the curse of God. And yet, in a sense, that's irrelevant. Where we are, physically, geographically, is not the most important thing. The most important thing is what follows. Human religion puts all the emphasis on the place, and that's why the religion of Scripture or the faith of the Bible has gone away from a, a human geographical place as the center. And now we do not look to any place on earth as either the place of blessing or pilgrimage. We've been delivered from that. So the place is really not important in that sense. Notice what it says in the text, how he looked. It says, he lifted up his eyes. Does that not remind us of in Hebrews 12, where that same principle is brought before us in that, in, in that passage where we are exhorted to raise our eyes above this world and, and not to be looking down, but look unto Jesus. We think of that account in 
the Gospels and also in the book of Acts where the disciples are exhorted to look to him. But then what he saw, there stood a man over against, or as the margin says, opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. Similar in a sense to what John saw in Revelation chapter 1, except the mouth is proceeding, or the sword is proceeding from the mouth of the Lord Jesus in that text. We need to have an encounter, may I say, a confrontation with the Lord Jesus. Tomorrow, God willing, we'll consider briefly in in Acts where, where Paul has a confrontation, or to put it more correctly, the Lord Jesus has a confrontation with him. And this is at the beginning, and we could look at many scriptures to prove this point, that before we can enter the battle, or even before we can enter, just put it in simple terms, the service of the Lord Jesus, we must have a serious engagement and encounter with Him. That's where it begins. And it not only begins there, but it continues there. That's why the apostle says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Fourthly, Joshua has a a great concern. His concern is, art thou for us or for our adversaries? Quite understandable. Very important question uh, for Joshua. We remember in Acts chapter 8, or sorry, Romans uh, chapter 8, if God be for us, who can be against us? And Joshua wants to know at this point, this one that I'm seeing, If he is against us, we're in trouble. Remember the story of David and Goliath and how all Israel trembled because of this giant. Because of this one who was challenging the armies of Israel. And they literally trembled at his presence. And and Joshua wants to know at this point, is is this one, is this warrior that I'm seeing, is, is he going to be against us? Or is he going to be on our side? Then we have the clarifying answer in verse 14. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. You see, it's good to know that God is on our side, but the real perspective is this. That we are to be on his side. Choose you this day, Joshua, as he learned the lesson, choose you this day whom you will serve. So the great concern for the believer, yes, we want to know that God is for us. Of course we do. Yes, we want to know in the midst of all our our, our trials, our troubles, that God is for us. But here is a wonderful clarification that we need to take hold of, that Joshua needed to take hold of. That the battle is not ours. That as the walls of Jericho will fall, Joshua, you will need to realize that the battle is not yours, but the battle is the Lord's. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And as soon as we make the mistake of thinking for a moment that it's down to us or that it's our battle, we will fail. We fail at the most important point. And then we have... A submissive request. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? So the the leader, 
of the army becomes a worshiper. So in, even in this conference, let us remember that it's so important, yes, we're in a battle, we're in a conflict, we're in a trial. But in the midst of all that, we are called to be worshipers of God. The greatest thing that we can do, either on earth or in heaven, is to worship God. Because remember, the world worships its gods daily. The world worships its gods. One of the things that that grieves me is that how we can, even as believers, get more excited about the things of the world. So in the last day or two, we've been driven by politics. Even in the Republic of Ireland, we watch avidly the the politics of the UK and over here I'm sure many people just give themselves and they get excited and it's understandable to some degree uh, but we should never be as excited about those things as we must be thrilled by our God moved by our God confronted by our God challenged by him. This is an encounter we all need to have. And it's easy to read Joshua 6 and get caught up in the the glory of it all, but it's all based on the last three verses of chapter 5. This encounter that Joshua has with the pre-incarnate Christ. And then we have a solemn requirement in verse 15. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. We are to recognize the holiness of God. This is a holy war. This is a battle between a God who is thrice holy. He is holy, holy, holy. And between the most wicked creature we can imagine. The most horrible creature we can imagine. There is no gray area between. This is a war between absolute righteousness and absolute wickedness. And we need to know clearly what side we are on so that we stand for truth. And there's there's so much scripture we're not going to look at over these five times. One of the things I had to accept at the early stages of preparing for this was the amount of scripture I couldn't even mention. But the Bible is full of this subject. It begins in Genesis 3 and it ends at the book of Revelation. It's the greatest subject, one of the great subjects of Scripture, the conflict between our God and the enemy. And then, notice lastly, before we go to Colossians, what I'm calling a sufficient or just a a proper response. And Joshua did so. Isn't that wonderful? There's so much in, in, in those four words. Joshua just did what he was commanded. And the wonderful freedom and liberty of the Christian life is that we're simply called just to do what the Word of God tells us to do. That we don't have to imagine or invent ways of fighting this conflict in our way. We, we simply do what God says. We simply follow his command, and that really covers so much, doesn't it? Just do what God says.
Just obey him. And in fact, when you, when you think about it, the one thing the devil does not want us to do is to obey God. The one thing he strives against us to do is to obey him. We see that, don't we, in Genesis 3? To undermine the word of God, to put doubt upon the word of God, to question God all in an attempt to get us to stop doing what God has said. Listen, the victory is in obedience. It's not the grounds of obedience, but it's the means of obedience, or sorry, of victory. To obey Him. Simply to do what He has told us to do. And there is liberty in that. There is freedom in that. Well, let us turn in the rest of our time to Colossians chapter 2 and or Colossians I should say and what I want to look at because we've looked at a general principle there in one sense that's the general principle I want to look specifically now in the rest of our time at a particular doctrine which Colossians is um, really written to address uh, because as I'm sure most of us know that Colossae was troubled by those who were seeking to undermine the sufficiency of Christ. All you have to do is read the letter to realize that's what was happening. And Paul writes the, uh, the letter to the Colossians to reinforce the doctrine that all we need is Christ. He is sufficient. He is enough. In fact, Samuel Rutherford said they who gain Christ lose nothing. We have all in him. All we need is in Christ. Again, that brings us back to Joshua 5. When Christ is on our side, we are the victors. I want to present to you briefly, I don't want to frighten you, I want to present to you briefly 11 points on the sufficiency of Christ. And I'll be brief on these points. The first point is, and we'll look at just some select verses in the book. Christ is sufficient because of what we have in him. Christ is sufficient because of what we have in him. Look at chapter 1, verse 14. In whom we have present tense reminding us of Romans 8 verse 1, now no condemnation, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And then down in verse 20 of chapter 1, or verse 21 I should say, verses 21 and 22, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind, by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. I remember a number of years ago, I think we noticed a, a kingdom hall, a Jehovah's Witness kingdom hall being built uh, down the road. I'm not sure if that's true, but I think there's one being built and you probably have Mormons in, in, in the, on the island as well. I remember two Mormons uh, came to my door. And um, as they began to talk, I, I interrupted them and said, and I, I can't remember everything I said, but basically what I said is this. I said, a number of years ago, I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the promise of Scripture, God has forgiven me all my sins. God has given me a name better than of sons and daughters. That I am an heir of God and a joint heir of Christ. And I said lots more, but in that vein. And I simply said to them, what more can you give me? What more can you give me on top of that? Is there anything else that I need that you can give me? And the two of them looked at each other and then looked at me and said, we don't think so. You see, when you have Christ, 
you have everything. They who gain Christ, as Rutherford said, lose nothing. We have all in him. We have redemption. And look what it says in verse 22. Look, look at those three words in verse 22. Christ has so redeemed us. Christ has so purchased us in order to present us holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. But the best is at the end. In his sight. Isn't that wonderful? That the, the redemption of Christ makes us or presents us. And the, how can we even grasp this? Because we know our own hearts. But his work makes us unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. That's the sufficiency of Christ. When we know that, we have the greatest defense against all heresy, against all temptation to run to some other place. When we grasp that we have everything in Him. All riches in the heavenly places are in Christ. And we are His. And He is ours. Christ has given Himself to us. Christ has vowed Himself to us. This is what we must come back to. This is why we must begin here in the battle. Because if you don't get this, you have failed before you've begun. And as I said at the beginning, we not only continue, start with this, we continue with this. The second reason why Christ is sufficient is because of who he is. Because of who he is. Look at verse 15 of chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the icon. He is the, the image of the invisible God. He is the stamp. Literally, the idea is where a stamp is taken and put on the paper and what you see. He's the exact representation, as Hebrews tells us. We can't see God. That's why John chapter 1 verse 18 tells us that no man has seen God at any time but, but the Son of God who is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared him. He hath made him manifest. He who has seen me, John 14, has seen the Father. Christ is sufficient because he is God. We don't need to go anywhere else. When we have Christ, we have all things. Listen to what Thomas Manton said on this thought. In the Scriptures, there is a draft of God. But in Christ, there is God himself. A coin bears the image of Caesar, but Caesar's son is his own lively resemblance. Christ is a living Bible. We have Christ, we have all. If God be for us, if Christ be for us, who can be against us? You see, we're, we're already more than conquerors through Him that loved us. We live in the reality, in the joy, in the satisfaction of the victory of Christ. So that we're not, if I can put it this this way, we're not trying to impress our God like the heathen. We're not trying to pacify our God like the false religions. We're living in the good of the knowledge of our God. As the Lord Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. 
See, it's all present tense. We're not waiting for something to happen. We're not hoping in that human sense for something to happen. It has happened for all those who believe in him now. That's why we don't have to move. One of the problems with Finneyism, wasn't it, that there was this implication, well, you have to come from the back to the front for something to happen. You don't have to move. You just have to realize what is ours in Christ. Realize what we have in Him. And then thirdly, Christ is sufficient because of what He has done. Look at verse 16 of chapter 1. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him. And all that's wonderful, isn't it? It's wonderful. And what a, a display of, of deity. But you know, the, the, the greatest evidence for deity in this verse is where? Where is it? Can you see it? Three words. I haven't read them yet. And for him. Everything in creation that was created was created for Christ. So the next time you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness, bring them to Colossians 1.16 and to the last three words and show them that everything that was created in heaven, including the throne of God, was created for Christ. Christ is sufficient. In Joshua doing what Christ said, the victory was secure. Fourthly, what he's doing. We're not deists, are we? We, we don't believe. What's a deist? Someone who believes the, that there was some deity who, who started creation and just let it go its own way. No, no. We, we believe in the biblical God. Look what it says in verse 17 of chapter 1. He is before all things. And by him, or the margin says, in him. In him all things consist. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, Upholding all things by the word of his power. All things. Every atom in the universe is upheld by the power of the word of Christ. Not one random rebellious atom. Even the atoms that make up the enemies of God are sustained by his power. The very breath in the atheist body. Even the devil himself is sustained by the power of God. By the power of Christ. That's our God. Not one thing can be done against his will. R.C. Sproul said that if there was one random atom in the universe, not under the sovereignty of God, God would not be sovereign. Every single molecule under his power and held together by him. That's the God we worship. Fifthly, Christ is all sufficient because of what he is. Verse 18, he is the head of the body, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Look at the definite article. He is the head. There's only one, not, I'll just say this briefly, not the Pope, as our confession says. One of the greatest freedoms that we can have is to be set free from false leaders, religious leaders who want to dominate us. The Christ who sets us free. The Christ who liberates us. The Christ who wants us to 
know his joy. I have come that they might have life in all its abundance, in all its fullness. See, when, we, when we're depressed and when we're doubtful and lack assurance, it's not of him. He wants you to be completely sure, to be fully sure. It's our own unbelief. It's our own doubts. We, we see in, in, the, in the Gospels how the Lord Jesus, time and time again, wanted to reinforce all the reasons why his disciples should just trust in him. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Trust in me. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm not a liar, I'm not the one the devil presents me to be. I'm not a deceiver. I, I'm not playing tricks. So if you lack assurance, it's not the revealed will of Christ that you should lack assurance. If you trust in him, know the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord, Nehemiah 8, is at verse 10. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So Spurgeon says that an assured Christian is like a mighty warrior in God's army. And again, if you lack assurance, maybe it's because you're spending too much time looking inward. If I just looked inward, even for the next five seconds, I would walk out the door. None of us get assurance from looking inward. Yes, we, we get conviction. Yes, we, yes it, 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 it helps us in our repentance, enables our repentance to some degree. But that's not where assurance is found. Assurance is in Him. Thomas Brooks said, Though Christ's coat was divided, He will never suffer His crown to be divided. That in all things, He might have the preeminence. Sixth reason why Christ is sufficient. This is a wonderful reason. How the Father regards him. Verse 19. How the Father regards him. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Do you know if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ Put it in human language. The Father cannot resist loving you because he loves his Son. This is my beloved Son. Hear him. I'm well pleased with him. The only way we can agree with God is to agree with him in Christ. We must see him as the beloved of the Father. Just like in a, in a human experience, if, if we have an issue with a, a member of a family, we're, we're picking an argument with the rest of the family in that sense. But when we show love and, and trust towards a member of the family, we're, we're, we're bringing in the rest with, with them. And then we come to what I'm calling the central statement of Christ's sufficiency over in chapter 2 and verses 8 to 10. The central statement where Paul in, in, in these verses really gets to the point of his letter, the, the burden of his letter, what drove him. The wonderful thing about the apostle, he was a, he was a pastor and a shepherd of souls. He loved the souls of his people. He talked about being burdened for the churches. One of the, the problems in, in the modern church, and I mean the Reformed church, is that we're not burdened enough for one another. We take care of our own little corner. We need to be burdened for one another, to love one another. The body principle in action. And he's so burdened that in chapter 2, verse 8, he, 
he, he tells the Colossians to beware. And there's four points here. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, man's ideas. The devil loves to bring in man's ideas into the church. Well, this would be good to win people. This would be good tool of evangelism. And Paul says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, through his thinking. The word spoil there is taken from the, the imagery of an army, an invading army, and to defeat the army, uh, the other army, and then they take their goods. And that's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to spoil us, take away our goods. And Paul is saying, listen, if, if somebody comes in your midst and says Christ is not enough, they're taking away all that is good. And you'll have nothing left. Beware lest you're spoiled. And then secondly, by man's deception. Look what it says. And vain or empty deceit. Again, Genesis 3 where the deceit of the deceiver came into the garden. You see, the only way the enemy can actually defeat us is by lies. That's why the Lord Jesus called him the father of lies. That's his weapon. Because once we know the truth, we have, what does it say? We shall know the truth. And the truth, and I love the authorized version, excels here. Excels in many places, but <laughs> excels here. It's not as the modern version says, set you free. No, it's make you free. That's much more important. You can set a prisoner free from his cell and let him run away, but he's still in bondage to his sin, still in bondage to his corruption. The truth makes us free. And then the third one, is man's practices, the traditions of men. We do what we do here tonight, not because, I hope not because it's, it's traditional, but it's because, again, going back to Joshua 5, because God's word says it. We sing the Psalms because God's word says we're to sing the Psalms. So G.I. Williamson gives a story of two groups in a, in a congregation and and, and one's arguing for traditional uninspired hymns, and the other's arguing for modern uninspired hymns. And Williamson stands up and says, you're both wrong because none of you have mentioned the Word of God. You're all saying what you want, what you like, what you desire. What does God want? Was his argument. We do what we do because it's God's will. Brings us back to our opening points. And Joshua did so. He just did simply, and he, even as it says of, uh, of others in Scripture, as, not just what God commanded, but as God commanded. And then, fourthly in verse 8, man's principles, or the rudiments of the world. And again, you see, he says here, and not after, or not according to, Christ. It's bringing them back. I meant to actually say at the beginning of the Colossians section here that when Paul opens Colossians, in the first four verses, he mentions Christ five times. He, he's really just repeatedly, again and again and again, bringing Christ before them. As Martin Lloyd Jones one time said in, in this idea, you know, he can't get enough of Christ. And we need to bring Christ before our own minds, our own hearts, our own souls, and keep bringing it before the, the souls of our, our families, the minds of our families, until they either believe or reject him. Because that's all that matters. Because it goes on to say in the next couple of verses, and ye are complete in him. People need to realize 
that we are not promoting just religion, just a good way of life. We are proclaiming Christ. And that they realize that Christ is everything to us. So often we settle for second best. Richard Sibbs says, it is a destructive addition to add anything to Christ. An illustration I, I, I like, simple illustration, is you know, orange juice is a nice drink. And milk is a nice drink. But add the two of them together, and you've destroyed both. Christ is all we need. We add nothing to him. Because to add one thing to him is to destroy the good of Christ to our soul. See, we all need to get to the point where we realize I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm not any more accepted because of my obedience. I'm not any more accepted because I go to church. I go to church because I am accepted. I meet with the people of God because we are accepted in Him and, and we, we long for the times of fellowship. We long to meet with Christ. And, and we don't come to the conference because He's a great speaker, but because He's speaking of Christ. He's exalting Him. He's lifting Christ up. He's speaking of the One whom my soul loveth. That's what's precious. how we need to mourn that we do not love him as we should. So often we're moved by the things of the world more than by him. So read the Song of Solomon and mourn your lack of love for Christ. You can't read those verses with a full heart but with embarrassment. The phrase in verse 9 of chapter 2, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That word dwelleth means to, you, you know where, where Paul says to the Ephesians that Christ might dwell in your hearts by faith. That Christ might dwell easily. Like someone who's the owner of a home. And the fullness of the Godhead dwells comfortably in Christ. Well, the eighth reason why Christ is sufficient is because of what he is to the believer. Look at chapter 3, and we'll move on very quickly to the end now. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, If then... If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above. Love the things above. Love heaven. Love communion with God. Love Christ. Love the thought of one day when you leave this world, you'll be with him when we see him. We shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. Love those things. You see, that we, we must love these things or we will never live in the joy of these things. So a marriage breaks down because we simply stop loving one another. We must love Him. We must love Him. I've got a quote from Thomas Watson. I won't read it. It's, it's a bit long, but let me give, give you the, the essence of the quote. There's many things we can't respond to God in like manner, but we must always respond to him in his love. We must always meet God 
1 John. Read 1 John. The test. The test of our faith. Do we love him? Do we love the brethren? Verses 3 and 4. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Christ, verse 4, who is our life. So when we try to live without Christ, we're killing ourselves. Because our life is hid with Christ and God. He's our life. It's like trying to if you're on a life support machine and, and pulling the patient away from that which is sustaining the life. Christ is that which the one who sustains us. And then, I'm moving on, the ninth reason. Christ, and this is a tough one, easy to say, very hard to put into practice. Christ is our example. Now I'm going to assume that this is not the most spiritual church in the world. I'm going to assume that you struggle. I'm going to assume that you have difficulties. And you have difficulties even with each other. I've been long enough in the ministry to realize even in a small church there can be real problems between members of a church. But look what chapter 3 verse 13 says. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So is there anybody that you avoid shaking their hand? And I, I don't know. Maybe none of that exists here. Is there people you maybe try and sit on the other side of the church? Or you just avoid? And is there an unforgiving heart over some issue? Now I could be speaking completely out of turn. But knowing my own heart and knowing the hearts and lives of others, there must be something of that. And Christ is all sufficient because he is our example. We are not to hold grudges. We're not to be mean-hearted. We are to be generous in our forgiveness even as God in Christ forgave us. So Thomas Adams said, He that demands mercy and shows none ruins the bridge over which he himself is to pass. Did you get that? He that demands or seeks mercy from God and shows none himself, ruins the bridge over which he himself is to pass. God loves us in a very particular way when we forgive as he has forgiven us. And that's why the Lord's Prayer assumes we will. It assumes we will. As we have forgiven those who trespass against us. Listen, if we're not forgiving one another generously, God is not pleased. And you're harming yourself. You're harming yourself. And I know nothing of the life of this church. Nothing. But I have to assume, you see, as I come to you this weekend, I've tried to fight the temptation just to preach in such a way that people will say, that was a wonderful sermon. You know, so it's all about me. 
Now, I, I've, I've tried to prepare, or at least I believe it's of the Lord, to prepare in such a way that I try and minister to you. So that we are made conformable to his image. And that we're transformed into the image of Christ. Because that's reformation, isn't it? That's revival. When we become more like him. That's heaven. That's glory. That's joy. When we become more like Christ. Isn't it? And then, tenth, Christ is the all-sufficient resource in our worship. 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and so on. Psalms are the word of Christ. So don't let anybody say, and this is sort of a, I suppose a, an issue for us in Dublin. We're the only psalm singing church in Dublin. I probably view it as a bit of a dinosaur or, or something in Dublin. I'm not sure. I don't really care because it's the word of Christ dwelling richly that matters. You see, we're using human wisdom if we think we have to sing with, with man's ideas that are better than God's. What right do men have to think that they can write better words than the Holy Spirit. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And then lastly, Christ is our all Sufficient Savior. Because all we do is to be done in and for Him. Colossians 3, 17. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. He's the beginning and the ending. He's the Alpha and the Omega. It's all for Him. It's all in Him. Lastly, in verses 23, on, under the same heading, verses 23 and 24, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Oh, may God bless his word to our souls.